Hi everybody, I'm Lexi Hamilton Smith, your MC for this part of the evening, uh, which is a Q&A for about half an hour. We're going to keep it very informal. Plenty of questions please at the end. Uh, we've got four uh, victims here who I'm going to grill. Um, this is a bit like a Q&A on the ABC, but we're not allowed to have any politics today, okay? No politics, Christine particularly. <laughs> no politics. And because today, as you all know, is World Alzheimer's Day, I was reading uh, up on it again today, 350,000, uh, I'm not allowed to say sufferers, Christine tells me, we say living, people living with dementia. Um, they like to say living with, surviving with, having a life with. It's a very important thing to be aware of. Um, there is no cure and no medical breakthroughs at this point. So of course QBI is leading the way and we're going to hear that very shortly. And one of the reasons most of you are here tonight of course is to raise funds. So we're tipping you upside down, down emptying your pockets. <laughs> Raffle tickets are plenty so if you get tapped on the shoulder you've got no choice. Um, $20, $50, $150 packages with Lucky Dips for free wine. So head upstairs later on and you can have a look. But it's my very great pleasure, I'm going to sit down right now so I can fiddle my notes around, uh, to introduce our special guests on our Q&A panel today. We've got Victoria Beadle, who's CEO from Alzheimer's Australia, Queensland, Victoria. We have Professor Jürgen Gotts, the Director of the Clem Jones Centre for Ageing Dementia Research at QBI at St Lucia. And we have the gorgeous punk, who I've met a few times at media briefings, but of course formerly is known... <laughs> gorgeous. <laughs> Professor Panjak Saar, Director of the Queensland Brain Institute. And very importantly, a most amazing woman, Christine Bryden, who was... Uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's at the young age of 46 and she is here to help share her journey with us today and it's been an amazing time hasn't it some 20 years I think Christine okay so we're going to start with a few tough questions over here with the guys from QBI while the ladies get to relax a little bit um, Jürgen with over as I said 350,000 people in Australia suffering I will not let you suffering living with dementia and what are your hopes for the future because you're doing some amazing research certainly to do with, with mice yeah. I have to say I'm Lexi I'm very optimistic uh, maybe Alzheimer's disease cannot be treated but it's certainly possible to develop a disease modifying strategy such that the age of onset is delayed by maybe 10 years, 15 years. And I think we are also not working in isolation. So when you look worldwide, there are so many efforts uh, to tackle Alzheimer's disease. And, but it's also fair to say that, Alzheimer's, that Australia uh, makes a significant contribution to these efforts to combat Alzheimer's disease. And I think what's promising is, for example, the latest trials where vaccination has been shown to show efficacy in Alzheimer's disease patients. So that's extremely promising, and it's also helping our research. Well, tell us about your Eureka moment, because you've had one, and I know in the media <laughs> briefing I was at not long ago, it was pretty, it was pretty incredible. Yeah, I'm almost tired to talk about it, I have to admit. <laughs> yeah. And I should also say that, I mean, Pankaj can confirm this, in the life of a scientist, these moments, these Eureka moments are really rare. And so one has to cherish these moments. And so that's obviously the reason why we talk about it. And so what we have done is, and Gerhard Lalenga is also here in the audience. Uh, he's the first and only author on this paper. So we have shown that, and this was uh, an exploratory approach. So it was not hypothesis driven, but we just tried it out. And we found that by treating Alzheimer's mice, which are cognitively impaired, that it's possible by injecting microbubbles, a contrast agent, and using a scanning ultrasound approach, which is non-invasive, that it is possible to remove the toxic amyloid and also to restore memory functions fully. And this is absolutely exciting. We didn't expect that. We obviously hoped that we would see some effect, but that the effect would be so remarkable we did not really expect, we didn't hope for. And, but now the challenge is to take these studies which we have done in mice to humans. And there we have to overcome a few hurdles because the human brain is much larger than a mouse brain. A mouse brain is only this big, so it's really tiny. And also, uh, the human skull is much thicker and it's porous, so it's cancerous, which means that ultrasound is distorted and it's heating up the skull. So we have to develop ways to overcome the skull and this hurdle. 
<coughs> and also we hope that at some point, and I have assembled uh, a very talented team of biologists and medical engineers, and we are now working towards a goal to develop a device which eventually can go into the clinics. And we hope that when this device is available, that this would also assist in the delivery of drugs to the brain. Because as we know, most drugs fail because there's a blood brain barrier. And this is something we hope to overcome with this device. And I think that media briefing you talked about in the long term looking for volunteers and some testy yeah. journalists were saying guinea, guinea pigs. <laughs> you know, yeah. remember that, that yeah. day? There yeah. was a couple of quite cracky yes. journalists going, you mean guinea pigs. But at the end of the day, that's what you need. You need people who are willing to, to try these this incredible breakthrough to see whether it does work. Absolutely. Think. And so this also requires that we have all the safety controls in place. And the work we are doing is, is backed up by, by studies, not only in mice, but also in, in, in monkeys. And so, and there was a recent trial, maybe some of you have seen that in, in Paris, where an implantable ultrasound device has been used to treat patients with brain tumors. And this is very encouraging because this study showed that by sending ultrasound through brain areas which have a role in, in movement and in language, that these functions were not impaired in these patients. And also they did not develop seizures, which was somehow feared that, that this would happen. And so this is, encourages us that once you have a device, that it should be pretty safe. And um, so how much money do you need? Just in the units, oh. you know, <laughs> talking a couple of hundred? Lots of money, lots of money. <laughs> no, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, there are two steps. One is to develop a device, which is, which is relatively cheap. So this, this might may cost a few millions, but once one starts moving into clinical trials, it's getting really expensive. Mm -hmm. That's tough. And yeah. um, Professor Punk, am I allowed to call you that? Yeah. See me wet nice and relaxed tonight on Q&A. Um, a lot of evidence we know about exercise can help the body in general, but you've done a lot of studies on, on cognitive effects. Just tell us about what you've found in that respect to do with dementia. So these, these are results coming out of Perry Bartlett's lab, and Perry was standing over there. This is so, you know, when I was a medical student and some of the people here, you know, we were told we were born with a bunch of neurons and then mm. they basically start dying from mm. the time you're born. Mm. Well, Perry's group was the first group to show that there's actually stem cells in the brain. So these are cells which will regenerate and form new neurons. And these neurons, are, these stem cells are present in our brains and in animals' brains, and they continue on through life. But as you get older and older, the numbers of these cells drop down. So these cells are involved in memory formation. You know, that's the, one of the major roles that they have. And the results from Perry's lab, what, what they found is that if you exercise animals, older animals, and you exercise them, the numbers of these cells go up. So the decline that you see in cognitive uh, performance can be improved by just simply exercise. Now, this is not just any exercise. You know, there's a sweet spot. So if you do too little, it doesn't work. If you do too much, it doesn't work either. So at the moment, we're looking to find out where the sweet spot is. And trials in humans are about to start to see it. And we've heard, had heard a lot just more recently about neuroplasticity, but it is quite new, isn't it? How do you explain that to us in simple terms? Well, neuro, you know, the brain is a very plastic organ in, in the sense that it can change and, and reconfigure itself, and it takes many different guises. So some of it's just new proteins being made, and some of it is new cells being made, and some of it is just simply new connections connections that are there grow. And this is neuroplasticity. Mm. And in response to exercise, in response to experience, in learning, these connections change. That's how the brain operates. So can you reconnect an Alzheimer's brain? That's what you're trying so to that's the, that's the idea. Yeah. So some of the mechanisms that are involved in this plasticity are basically they're, they're interfered. Things like A-beta, which is one of the proteins laid down, interferes with this plasticity. Mm. So what happens when you remove the A-beta, some of the plasticity is restored. So that's the, the things we're thinking about. So the plasticity can be restored by taking out a beta, but exercise also helps. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, now, we'll get to Victoria in a minute, but I reckon we might talk a bit of politics then, so I'm just <laughs> going to leave you for a sec. Um, Christine, what an amazing journey. I think 46 uh, when you were diagnosed. What was that moment like? You'd just been divorced, I understand, with three kids. You, you, had, you were working as a scientist, you know. Your, your life was ahead, ahead of you at that time. I, I, I was on a career... I really, uh, and just suffering from stress, getting words muddled up and, you know, couldn't always get to places reliably and would turn the wrong way. I thought it was just stress because I was really doing a lot 
I was advising uh, the Prime Minister on science and technology at that time. So I then went to a doctor because of headaches. I didn't think about all that other stuff. I just just stressed. So they did brain scans and discovered the a considerable amount of atrophy, um, like a brain of you know about a hundred year old. Um, so let's hear it for neuroplasticity and new connections <laughs> and new cells and all of that because I've been working hard over the last twenty one years to do that. Um, so yes, it was a huge, huge shock because I was told that it would I'd be demented in five years, need to go in a nursing home, be dead in another three. And back then, Alzheimer's Australia was only for carers. So there was no help. And I just think it's wonderful what Alzheimer's Australia can provide now. Do you seem like such a fighter, Christine? Do you think if you'd just given up? I mean, some people oh, would yeah. give up at that point. They'd go, OK, that's my diagnosis. I'll just live with it. But you, you refused to do that, didn't you? And 21 years later, look at you now. Amazing. Well, I think baby boomers are a bit like that. I, mean. <laughs> I don't think we sort of sit down and take what the doctor says. So I think we really will be signing up for uh, research. Because when I talk to people with dementia, they're very keen to participate in clinical trials. They're very keen to help find a cure. I don't think you'll find a, you know, a scarcity of volunteers. Yeah. Um, so yes, I fight. Yes, yes, I know. My first words were, apparently, I can do it. <laughs> so yes, I'm probably still a bit like that. Your, your journey's not been an easy one, and I was reading today like there had been some, um, you know, disbelief in the in, in, in your diagnosis. I mean, I understand you have quite an unusual form of dementia, but I mean, that must have made you pretty angry. I mean, because you're you're taking this journey and giving it everything you've got to show that you can not overcome it, I guess, but you can live with it and have a life. Yeah, that, that has really upset me, even um, to tears on occasion, when people have said, you can't possibly have dementia because you can talk. Um, and or how, dare you know, how dare they say that? Well, just... they, I don't know quite, they said those can't be your brain scans because you can, and they, I mean, horrible things. Why would I fake having something that has a huge stigma and there's another whole conversation. Um, so yes, it has been awful at times and so at times I just didn't want to speak out anymore. Um, so if it wasn't for my lovely husband Paul, who's somewhere in there, out there, um, I wouldn't carry on because it's been too tough. It really has been. But with Alzheimer's Australia now, there's a lot more belief that people with dementia can be encouraged and they can speak out. And you've written a few books as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. oh, they're very heartfelt. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They're very much part of my journey um, and that hopefully help people as well. What message would you like to get across to this room, I guess, about any of us? Um, you know, we're always forgetting where we park the car or, you know, I left my iPad in the taxi the other day, cost me 80 bucks to get it back, you know, stupid things you do when you're busy. We all worry, don't we? I mean, what, yeah. what message do you want to get across to all of us and about understanding um, your journey? I think Alzheimer's Australia's got on its website, I think, or did have, the differences between ordinary memory loss and when you need to be concerned. When you need to be concerned, I mean, everybody forgets where to park the car but when you sit in the car and you can't remember which foot to put on what what those things down there and where you put your feet that's when you should get a little bit more concerned in terms of a message do go and get diagnosed if you feel that you have concerns go and find out if there's anything wrong because there is anti-dementia medication out there there's wonderful research happening and there's fantastic support from Alzheimer's Australia. That's a don't scary, leave it too late. Yeah, it's a scary step to take though, isn't it? It is, but don't leave it too late because the further <coughs> down you go, the less likely you can do the things you need to do to maintain function. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Christine. I'll uh, give you a little rest. <laughs> Victoria, I know you've had a personal journey yourself and you're CEO of, of Alzheimer's Australia for Queensland. Just tell us what your personal family journey was and then we can get on to the, the politics of what was happening sure. today. Um, well, I had a grandmother. My grandma, Dorothy, had dementia and that was quite some time ago, but I was part of the family unit that put supports in place 
for my granddad and grandma so that she could live at home for as long as possible. But back then there was um, a real lack um, of understanding about dementia. There was a lot of stigma around it and there really weren't family supports in place for us. Um, we'd often get the phone call in the middle of the night to say that my grandma had gone missing, um, often in very cold conditions in the UK in winter. Um, and um, we'd be the search party that had to go out and you know go and try and um, look at where, where she was and try and bring her home safely. So seeing my family go through that struggle and being part of that has made me um, particularly uh, passionate about the work that we do at Alzheimer's Australia and um, the enormous amount of work we need to do to um, support families impacted by dementia. The statistics you mentioned earlier, Lexi, are really shocking. I mean, we've got 353,000 Australians currently diagnosed with dementia, and by 2050, without a medical breakthrough, we'll have close to a million people with a diagnosis. And um, it's, it's not just the person with dementia, it's all their family that are impacted by that as well. So making sure that we are there and we've got vital support services for people with dementia into the future um, it has made me very passionate um, about getting out of bed every day. It's not a job, it's a privilege and a, and a joy. So today um, Ida Buttrose, you know, at the press club got quite involved. There was a lot of politics and it was about money and uh, not enough money and people not getting the, the right level of care. If you, you're poor, you're not getting the proper care and, and there's user pay, so people with money are being cared for adequately and others aren't. I mean, how has that gone today? Is it, she was quite controversial, wasn't she? Um, well, Ida's our national ambassador and um, herself, um, her father had dementia, so she is very um, vocal about the... Um, needs of people with dementia across Australia and I think you know we've had uh, Dr Ronald Peterson out from the US this week he was in Brisbane yesterday at the Brisbane Convention Centre and with ITER at the National Press Club today and I think um, the message is very clear that we do need a national dementia strategy here in Australia and we really need to follow the lead of um, the UK and, and the US in, um, in making that happen here and it was interesting here uh, hearing um, Dr. Pedersen talked yesterday about that because linking it back to research, but also vital support services, the investment in research in the USA, once they had a national dementia strategy, increased significantly in the billion dollars. Um, in fact, he said half a billion dollars increase in investment in the US. Um, and has he cared for some, he's cared for some fairly well known people, hasn't he? He has. He was the personal physician for Ronald Reagan when he had dementia and also. Um, um, Glenn Campbell, the country music singer, and um, he talked about how um, how well Glenn and his family coped with dementia. In fact, Glenn went on tour with a diagnosis of dementia and did 141 shows across the US, um, even though he had quite significant um, cognitive impairment and he had family supports around him to do that and to do it well. So the message is very loud and clear that you can live well with dementia if you've got the right supports early for as long as possible and I think um, the work that ITA and Alzheimer's Australia does nationally to raise awareness and having people like Christine who've lived through the diagnosis talk about it helps us to raise awareness and reduce stigma. Well Jürgen that just um, reminds me there was a YouTube hit last week I didn't see it but it was a dad who had dementia who re I, the only thing he remembers in his family it's, his life is the lyrics to the songs he doesn't remember the family the children's names anything and he was singing they'll be filming him in the car and he's now going to have an album out apparently oh, but i mean what impressive. does that say about the brain that you can remember every single word of every song you know and apparently he yeah. sings really well but he remembers nothing else just yeah. from your research i mean can you unlock that part or am i putting um, you on the spot I'm mainly working with animals, so I'm not the best person. Oh, don't they sing? I'm not the best person. I'm not the best person to comment on humans, but but animals and humans alike. I mean, there's selective loss uh, of, of when we look at the at a, at a brain of an Alzheimer's patient. It's not that uh, nerve cell loss would be uniform over the entire brain, but there's certain areas um, where the brain loss or neuronal loss is more pronounced here than others. So you lose certain memories. And, and, and certain memory functions, yes, others are less affected. So you, you equally could recite, you know, maths, yes. maths equations and, and, and I think that's more challenging, but I mean, music is a, is a good example. I mean, yeah. you've made, you memorize uh, melodies mm. from the past. Mm. So some memories are preserved. I should say, I mean, Pankaj can confirm this, 
But still today it's not known what the molecular correlate of memory is. So how is memory actually stored? Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how is it stored? What, what are the molecules? I mean, we understand a lot about the brain, but there's still a lot which we don't know. How there are the unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Yes. <laughs> <one that's got laughs> I want to come back to the press call when you can get the mice to sing. Okay. <laughs> just, just winding up now, Jürgen, how much pressure is, is on you and your researchers? I mean, you're most incredibly passionate people. I, I always am amazed. I mean, my job starts yeah. at the day and ends every day. Your day goes on for years, you know, waiting for that breakthrough. How much pressure do you feel you're under in, in this research where there is no cure at this point? I think there's a lot of pressure, especially when, let's say, someone with Alzheimer's or someone there, someone in the family has Alzheimer's calls. But I get a lot of phone calls or a lot of emails and once a person was calling me and he started to cry and say, and he was saying, the person who has raised me is now dying of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And it's very, that's very sad because, as you all know, progress in the basic sciences and what we do is, is slow. It just takes time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of discoveries take a few years. And we somehow may have made the comment or it may have somehow been interpreted like that, that we start clinical trials next year. And so we get now lots of emails where people contact us. I contacted you last year, so now are you now starting clinical trials and can you be enrolled? But obviously we have a lot of challenges and a lot of hurdles to overcome and these things simply take time. And one has, we have to do more animal experiments, we have to develop a device, we have to test this device let's say in sheep or in beagles or in non-human primates. So it's sim simply, it, it takes a while. And when you think, for example, of the new antibodies which now show efficacy, this research has started 16 years ago. So one, six, 16 years, that's a long time. Yeah. Well, keep going, you're amazing. Yeah. Thank you. No. And Pankaj, you know, in your role as director, I mean, what message would you like to get across? I know um, all the stories I've done in, in health and research, the, the funding it has dropped to such low levels, and I know that's not what tonight's all about, although you have to all buy raffle tickets, okay? But um, it, it's, a, it's a tough journey. I mean, you guys are on the you know, world breakthrough uh, you know, of an incre you know, curing an incredible disease, and yet, yet that's tough for you every day. Well, look, yeah, science, as Jürgen was saying, science is slow. But, you know, the thing is, as he was talking about ultrasound, where the discoveries are going to come from are really unknown right now. Yeah. And often they come from very, very remarkable places where you wouldn't think you could make those connections. So, you know, you have to think about, as, as director, I see a breadth of research in QBI, you know, it starts from small worms all the way to people. Yeah. And you should think about fun, sporting research across the breadth of it, really, because you never know where, where that find is going to come from and not just focus in on And you collaborate a lot, don't you, throughout, you, you know, you've said that to us, every team is working together in a way, Precisely, always yeah. briefing each other, because and it's the, the human body the that you're unlocking yeah. Yeah. The, the secrets of. The groups hang out together, and they work together, and talk to each other regularly, and this is where, you know, the <laughs> collaborations come from, and this is where the special sort of insights come from. So, you know, think about supporting science as, as, as a venture, basically, if you like, mm -hmm. and, and not sort of think about, well, look, we just want to think about one protein. You, know, you have to think across the breadth of it. And I think that's where the it's exciting times for the brain right now. Lots of things are changing mm -hmm. and exciting times ahead. Okay, thank you. Victoria, it seems to me still a bit of a, a hidden secret topic. Like, no one really wants to discuss it. It's, it's tough. Um, how, how can we change that with this national strategy? Do you think that's the only answer? Oh, look, I think um, you know, they say it takes um, a village to raise a child. I think it's the same about dementia. We need a full community effort around dementia. It, it needs to include um, all levels of government, from local government to federal. It requires our scientists, it researchers, it re requires people like Christine to stand up and share their story um, because our um, advocacy work um, has most impact when people tell their personal story. Um, you know, I spent lots of time talking to politicians, but um, I can tell them the facts and figures and, and the challenges, but it's only when people like Christine sit in front of them and say, this is how it's impacted my life, these are the challenges I face every day, and we need action. And it also requires all of our community to be aware of um, what dementia is, um, and we've done quite a lot of work around how to raise awareness and to create dementia-friendly communities in Australia, because we think that 
that is an important way that to raise awareness and to make our communities a safe place and a good place for people to live well with dementia. We've got a lot of people living at home, often alone um, with dementia, and they want to live fulfilling lives and it's our job at Alzheimer's Australia to help them to do that, um, to raise awareness and to provide programs that help them to do the best they can. So. Our services include counselling, support, making sure that people get access to early intervention programs. Christine mentioned the importance of getting an early diagnosis. It takes 2.6 years on average in Australia from first consult with GP to diagnosis. That is a terribly long time to live not knowing what's wrong and not getting vital support services, access to the medications um, and um, supports in place so for us raising awareness is, is, is critical. All right thank you so much and Christine um, I'm going to get you to wind it up for us but you know your story is so full of hope and positivity um, but what's your future when you stare down that barrel what do you think of? I'm donating my brain to the scientists do you want it, Jürgen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well... <laughs> can we have... OK. Uh, people have said they're very keen because there's a lot of information out there on my brain, obviously. And that's the way I personally can help. But how much longer can I last without curative treatment? I'll call it disease-modifying treatment. I mean, there are over 100 causes of dementia. Alzheimer's is only one of them. Um, it's going, you can't have a one cure fits all type of model unless we, you know, you know you're drilling down to the fundamental mechanisms and when you, you get to the fundamental mechanisms that are going awry in my brain, that would be brilliant because then I can modify and at least stop losing more brain cells and more pathways and having bigger struggles every day. So I hope to last long enough but I've already had to last 21 years, and I was told there'd be a cure in five. <laughs> the pressure's on, Jürgen. Oh, thank you so much, everybody. I mean, and Christine's story, I've met her beautiful husband here tonight. Uh, it's a true story of love, isn't it, that you met when you had your diagnosis and what, what the first date or one of the first few dates you told him? Well, yes, yeah, so he was too nice to sort of hide that big. <laughs> Where is he? Where's Paul? Hand up. Where is he? He's hiding her. Oh, there he is. Uh, wave. Um, it must have been an amazing. It must have been an amazing time for you, having someone to love you through this journey and know that he will be there for and you. And his father died of Alzheimer's, so mm. it's, he knew what he was getting, um, and he got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We've just got a, a few minutes for questions. Has anyone got any questions you'd like to ask? <coughs> Thank you very much. I just wanted to give you a personal insight as well in regards to the music and role of music in the brain. I'm a doctor, my father was a doctor and he has advanced Alzheimer's. But I was fascinated by the fact that though bedridden and um, you know completely uncommunicative, he was able to respond to the nurse's singing and said thank you at the end of that. Um, so I was impressed with that from Oliver Sacks's talk and musicophilia. I think maybe musical therapy could be further utilised in the early um, stages and also in regards to keeping ourselves active mentally as well as physically. Um, just explaining another skill is learning a new skill such as sewing or painting or something not just physical but mentally different to what we're used to. What are your thoughts on those? I'd love to make a comment on that if I could. Um, Alzheimer's Australia has got a, a brain health program called Your Brain Matters and that is very much focused on trying to raise awareness that no matter what age you are there are things you can do to improve your brain health and there are um, I guess five key steps to that um, and, and the, um, the team at QBI are working on exercise so we talk a lot about uh, regular exercise but the, the um, social connectivity is really important making sure when people get the diagnosis that they remain connected because we often hear friends fall away um, eating well um, and, and eating healthily and also um, just making sure that people do get their um, cardiovascular risk factors monitored so heart health is really, really critical. Um, high blood pressure, stroke, risk of um, heart attack are all very much linked to dementia so making sure that people do that. 
And in terms of music, we run a music therapy at our Gold Coast Respite Centre and um, seeing some of the clients that come and enjoy that program. And um, we also run a dance program in Brisbane, which maybe Christine can talk about the difference that, um, that that's made. Yeah, that, the dance program, that's the Tina's one, isn't it? Yeah. 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 We, I tried dance where you had to do certain steps and learn steps and I thought, no, I just can't do that. But what we could do was move to music and use, it was, it's really expressing communication non-verbally through movement and gesture to music. Um, and we found that people with dementia really enjoyed it. So it was social, it was active, um, you know, it hit all those buttons. Uh, and probably mentally challenge their brain too, to try and think of ways to express themselves, because that's also an important aspect. Mm. Right, very important. Jürgen, have you got something to say on that just before we wind up? Music programs? Sure, to yeah. say something to that, yeah. <laughs> I think there's no doubt that, let's say, having an emotionally stimulating life, having an active life, uh, that the diet has an effect, and exercise has an effect, but it's really difficult to tease these things apart uh, because someone who may have an active life may also have a social life and also may do exercise and may also lead, eat healthy food. So it's, I have no doubt that, um, that there are ways somehow to slow down the disease, but I think one should also see on the other hand, and I think the extreme view would be that leading a healthy life and doing exercise and all that can prevent Alzheimer's disease. For example, in Germany, there's, there's a doctor who is claiming that, and he published a book, and people love to read this. They think by having adopting a specific lifestyle, this would prevent them from developing Alzheimer's disease. That's dangerous, and dangerous, that's dangerous territory, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I think we are not arguing as basic scientists that there's nothing we as, as, as humans can do. But on the other hand, one has to appreciate that I think it needs the development of drugs or therapeutic interventions to treat Alzheimer's disease. All right. Just, just winding up. I can see you're champing in the bit there. Um, so there's more, uh, just, just so we know, winding just, up, there's... Just a quick point on that, because I agree totally with Jürgen, because you don't want to blame the person with dementia for having got it. Yeah. Because Absolutely. they didn't do all these things. That's really upsetting. There's no guarantees. There's no guarantees. And until we really find out what is causing or underlies all these forms of dementia, then there's just no guarantee at all. Absolutely. I was, so just, I was just going to say Christina's not going to stop talking all night, so she's <laughs> going to be out there having more champagne, so please feel free to come up and talk to her. <laughs> no, no, please. Uh, all our fantastic guests are just around. There's a half an hour of drinks and canapes, and then we've got a fantastic recital upstairs, so please just relax. But I know everyone's willing to talk, talk and ask, answer any questions that you've got while we're outside, so thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Christine. Thank you, Victoria. Hi, Jürgen.